So I actually uh, thought I would talk a little bit um, about the budget. Um, as, uh, and then I can take questions about county government generally, uh, if you want. I think most of you have an understanding of what is county government does, what we've done for the past 180 years or so. Uh, we are branching into some different areas that are more support related to agencies and towns and the community. Um, as uh, property tax dollars get a little tighter, one of the uh, directions that we're going in is uh, trying to have discussions with communities um, about what their needs are, what it is we might be able to do for them or with them that we haven't done before, uh, particularly um, with respect to perhaps finding funds to do things that uh, their budgets might not allow. Um, we've uh, uh, increasingly got involved in a number of activities around um, substance abuse and uh, 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 prevention uh, efforts in uh, young adults with the Banana Voices for Prevention. Uh, we've um, spearheaded a, a group called OREST, which has to do with offender re-entry and trying to uh, tighten up the network of services that are provided to people that return to the community after having violated the law. Um, we were in, we've just uh, recently hired a grant support specialist uh, to facilitate uh, grants coming in uh, to do things for basically anybody uh, um, where it's appropriate for the county to serve as a conduit for those funds that either might not get to this area or might uh, have a requirement that it flow through a government entity. Uh, and so most of those things are the things that uh, county government typically hasn't done. <coughs> um, the county, I think, has taken a much larger role in terms of getting law enforcement grants, mostly through the efforts of Dick Foote. Uh, and, uh, 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 and that's been good. So we're uh, looking at that and we're actually trying to do similar sorts of things for social service agencies and the towns. And just beginning a dialogue that says, what, it, it, notwithstanding whatever whatever county government did for you yesterday, what can they do for you tomorrow that's different? Uh, what do you need? How can we coordinate our efforts? How can we make government a little more sustainable and not simply pull all the money out of the ta property tax base? Uh, we uh, we worked hard to get the discussion going about the medication take back. As many of you know, I think from the last time I spoke to you, or maybe it was just the, the directors of the lunchtime meeting. Right. Uh, the number of pharmaceuticals that are hanging around and being flushed down the toilets and thrown into the trash is just huge. Everybody is quite aware that we prescribe probably four times the number of prescription drugs now that we did even a couple of decades ago, and um, and it's showing up in the water, and it can't be removed. There's no systems of water treatment in any municipality <coughs> that are effective at removing these drugs from the water. So that they're present in the water is alarming. Um, we, uh, the good news is we don't think there's anything wrong with it. The bad news is we haven't really studied it. Uh, and that's the problem. <coughs> so we're getting involved in that and uh, utilizing our existing resources, not adding resources, to uh, spearhead these efforts and, and uh, help bring the community together. Um, in terms of the budget, um, I um, was speaking last night at the Granite State Fair Tax Coalition. Uh, is that the right name, Jane? And uh, one of the things we were talking about is what we're going to do about how we pay for government. Um, the state's budget was, of course, everybody's aware of. They're making dramatic cuts. We went through this in the last biennium with uh, Governor Lynch um, scrambling to reduce the budget by to fill a $220 million gap. At uh, that time, and this is not too long ago, he said the cuts are not going to be painless and services to citizens may be reduced. And that was with a $220 million shortfall. Uh, by all accounts, we're headed to something of a six to $800 million shortfall. Uh, so it raises an interesting question. Uh, who's going to take care of the people? Uh, an $800 million shortfall 
just to put it in perspective, is essentially the entire health and human services budget, the general fund budget for the state of New Hampshire. Um, so it's not a small number. Uh, one of the things that the state does, of course, is they reduce their spending. When they reduce their spending, many of those costs come down to the local level. They come down to the city, they come down to the county, they come down to the towns. Uh, over the last 20 years, funding practices at the state have taken the county nursing home from a break-even proposition where it did not require <coughs> any subsidy from the property tax base and turned that into a $4 million deficit. So $4 million of property taxes supports Maple. 20 years ago, didn't have to do that. Uh, that's a trend that continues. Every six months, we get a letter from the state saying, oh, we didn't budget enough money. So you can look forward to a 5% reduction in the reimbursement. Oh, it's only 5%. Oh, thank heaven. Well, you know what that is? That's $12 million. It's $12 million that gets spread around at the county level. Uh, for people we already have, or people who are already identified as having a need, um, and historically, you people pay it out of your property tax because we have established an expectation and a commitment to take care of those people who need long-term care. Whether they're in Maplewood or any other nursing home, if they come from Cheshire County, the county pays a substantial portion for their care no matter where they are. Um, we've never really had a dialogue, I don't think, the community, the citizens, um, about the impact of this trend and what it is we're going to do to fund it. If we don't do anything and the state continues to make the adjustments that it has to make because it doesn't have the money, then the property tax is going to continue to grow. It's fine if everybody wants that. Uh, it's fine if everybody says there's no new taxes under any circumstance. Then you can expect that the property tax will grow. Another example, when the state um, made uh, changes uh, in the last couple of years uh, temporarily to reduce the amount of money it puts into the state retirement system for government employees, that shifted um, a couple hundred thousand dollars down onto the county tax bill. Uh, they went from 35% to 25%. Historically, uh, local uh, government uh, employees whether they're police, fire, or, or others in school, there was a cost sharing where the state paid a certain portion of retirement funding and then the local municipality made up the rest. State said, oh, man, we don't really have enough money to fund that stuff. Um, so they changed it, which, but the same money needs to be collected. Um, so that shift, uh, added, that, that shift in 2011 will add about $228,000 we pay we pay about 1. 1.2 million dollars to fund the retirement for the county employees. Um, so this is going to grow. Um, supposedly, next year, the year after, I can't remember which one, the percentage that the state contributes is supposed to return to the level that it was previously. But looking down the barrel of an 800 million dollar shortfall, <coughs> I think it's probably pretty unlikely that the state will ever resume funding anything to the level that it used to. So it raises an interesting question. What, what, do you, what do we want the role of government to be, given that we appear to have made a lot of promises to a lot of people um, that uh, we're just not going to be able to meet? Uh, and I don't know the answer to the question, but when, when, we, when we go through the budget process and there's all of these increases, and the taxpayers and the elected officials get upset about it. Those are some of the reasons. Uh, if we're not going to pick up the slack in the areas where we have been, when the state cuts the budget, then we need to have a discussion about, well, how are we going to pay for these things? Are we going to still provide the services to the people um, that have gotten them in the past? Or are we going to start saying, you know, I'm sorry, but government can't really help you just since this recession began, 
there's been 12,784 new people who have become Medicaid eligible. Those are new people. Uh, in the last 10 years, the number of Medicaid enrollees has doubled. All of this is happening at a time when the shortfalls of the budget are getting larger. So there's a huge gap. And uh, unless we change the way we think uh, and change how we collect money or have a new discussion about what's the role of government, what services should they provide, then the property taxes are going to continue to be where those shortfalls get front, uh, funded from. Um, so I don't know where it's going to go, but when you look at your county budget, when you look at the city budget, uh, and you look at your town budget, uh, reductions in aid to cities and towns, changes in education funding, uh, reductions or not keeping up with the pace, all of those, uh, and, and more, I'm sure there's, I know there's more, uh, all of those just go down to the property tax. So I, I'm inclined to just open it up to some questions. I think that's a little more useful. Yes. What is the condition of uh, the nursing home at this point, and where do you see the future of the nursing home? Going? Well, that's a good question, and I hope, and I'm imagining that we're going to have uh, some discussions about that. I imagine what we'll do is hold some public forums uh, about what we do. Uh, Maplewood Nursing Home, the building is 35 years old. Um, literally, there is not a week that goes by that we're not replacing some failed sewer pipe or water pipe. Um, roofs begin to leak. The electrical system is getting overburdened. Um, it's an old building, and uh, we need to uh, think about some long-term uh, plans. We did do a bit of a study to see what it would take to make renovations to it, to put an addition on it or to build from scratch a home facility, perhaps closer to the team. Uh, you will remember that we spent, oh, I don't know, a decade uh, deciding to move the jail closer to team because those people needed services. And, uh, and yet the nursing home needs literally 10 times the amount of services from the city, uh, resources, not <coughs> capital C, small C, than the jail ever did. So it, I can't imagine it would make sense to build a new nursing home out in Westmore. But a new nursing home is going to cost $60 million. What's $60 million going to do to the property tax just in terms of principal and interest? It'll probably add another $5 million, but only for the next 20 years. Um, and then there's the operating deficit. If the, thing, if the trend continues on and we still want to be in the nursing home business and we're still willing to pick up the deficit from the state budget, then you can anticipate potentially a $10 million property tax hit simply to take care of the 150 people that are not all Medicaid, but 80% of them are um, at the nursing home. So it's an interesting dialogue to have about what it is we want to do with these people. We've done it. We've been the provider of care for the elderly and the indigent for 180 years. We, we virtually invented the nursing home business, county government. Uh, in this country. We were taking care of these people when nobody else would, when nobody else could. That's why we did it. Um, but we don't have to be in the nursing home business. We have a statutory obligation to pay for long-term care in collaboration with the state and the federal government. So we don't have to necessarily operate a facility. Historically, we've operated a facility because nobody else was doing it way back. Um, and with the rough and tumble of budgets and um, concerns about quality of care, the county government has a history of always providing good quality care with adequate resources without regard to uh, whether it's paying for itself. Hence, the continued subsidy to provide a level of care regardless. We also take at uh, Maplewood the most difficult most sick, most expensive people that simply cannot get into any other facility. No nursing home has to take anybody that they don't want to take. If they're too sick, if they're too expensive, if they're on too many meds, if they have uh, a, 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 a 
behavioral problem or a level of dementia that's difficult, uh, it is very, it's almost impossible to place them. And so we, uh, in many ways, are the nursing home of last resort. And, and we also have the highest level of quality consistently over the decades. Um, but that all adds to the increased cost. That all increases the level of subsidy. Uh, so if we weren't in this business, We'd have to ask and answer the question, well, who will take care of those people? We'd have to make some changes probably in a regulatory or a statutory level to uh, say to private uh, and non-profit nursing homes, hey, <coughs> in, in for a dime, in for a dollar, if you're going to take Medicaid dollars, you can't cherry pick. You can't just take the, the nicest, healthiest <coughs> residents where you can make the most money. You have to take the sick people. And then we'll talk about what that reimbursement is. But that's a discussion we need to have because it has long-term, I'll uh, say permanent, impacts on the county budget. And I hope that it will ha have the opportunity over the next, uh, I'll say, a few years to uh, have a lot of discussion <coughs> because at some level, it's a, it's a, a, a one-way street. You know, we're going to make this decision. We're going to continue this commitment. We're going to be in it for another 30, 40 years. So I hope we get to have that discussion that, uh, so that at least we all go into it with our eyes open. Yes. Has the county got any thoughts or anything about using the King Junior High School for any county purposes? Uh, where it is now, it's a nice location. I can see it was. Um, well, the short answer is no. Um, I did, I did have a thought that, um, that it was a while ago, that the, uh, the school uh, uh, might have uh, offered some opportunity for what might be called the government center. Maybe we put a bunch of government offices in there, get out of some of the buildings we're in, return those to the tax base, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think the problem with that is, because uh, I don't know what else the, high school, the, the school's going to be used for. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's nice to think somebody's going to come into town and put a lot of money into it to develop and all will be happy and shopping and boutiques, but no. Well, they're trying to have our courthouses or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't think the money is there for that. I don't think politically anybody uh, would be interested in spending much for the school. You know, you can't. It's not like we could buy it. That doesn't benefit anybody. It's a, it's a, when you, if we were to buy it from the school system, it's a lose-lose for everybody. Because we end up encountering a debt, which goes on to the taxpayer. And the school gets a short run of money, which doesn't benefit the taxpayer for very long. And they're the same taxpayers that are going to pay for the purchase over here. So the only way I see it happening is, here's a dollar, let's call it a day. Uh, that would be the same with the SAU building. I mean, you know, it's a double punishment. For the, for the taxpayers if we're buying from another government. Um, but I, so I tend to think it's too complicated. The reason why the courthouse construction project is slated to be where it's going to go, hopefully, is a couple of reasons. Um, it's um, the construction and operation is virtually budget neutral for the county and the city. Uh, but that side of street, of the street in, in that area, is uh, low income census tracking. What that means is with federal new market tax credits, we can essentially buy down the cost of the project by about 38 or 40 percent. So that, um, and then between the, the, the work that, and the contributions that have financial value that the city is going to put in, that the county is going to put in, that's what makes it affordable. Because we're essentially building a $10 million building for what will amount to about $3 million worth of debt. So that makes that a good return on investment, which uh, Medic will own, at least in the short term. It had to be built and developed by a private entity uh, in order to take advantage of the new market tax credits. Well, seven years down the road, it has to be refinanced once we get the value of the tax credits out. Um, we're moving in a direction where either state can have an option to buy it, we don't need to be in the landlord business for the courts, uh, or the county can buy it. Uh, recognizing that it contributed about a million dollars worth of land. So, you know, at the end of the day, it, it should be a good real estate deal. Um, 
and if and if and if Meta continues to own it and the state continues to police it, then the rent's coming in. And so, but that's why that location, as against any other, seem to have premium. Now that low market, uh, those the new market tax credits aren't going to last forever. With the new census figures, we're anticipating that that area is no longer going to be uh, reporting out as it did. So uh, there's a fairly short window of opportunity to take advantage of the 38% discount. Jane. What is your reaction uh, to the comments made in the paper the other day that one of the judges had felt that the courthouse plan is not going to offer enough room for any period of time into the future, that it's going to be too small. We talk about different ways of handling people who have committed crime without incarcerating them, but we're still going to need court space to take care of their cases. So what's your outlook on that? Well, if we didn't underbuild it, we'd hardly be called government. Pardon? If we didn't underbuild it, we'd hardly be called government. But well, I know, but why do we keep making these things? We're going from, we, the, the, the courts, are going from about 40,000 square feet. They're in the, the Superior Court being court, they run about 35,000 square feet <coughs> in the existing Superior Court building. District Court's about 5,500 square feet, admin and all the rest. So you got about 40,000 square feet. We're going to scrunch everybody into 25,000. wasn't my idea. To be clear, um, but the uh, court folks in Concord, um, well, uh, one, that's all they can afford. Uh, but two, they've decided that that the various levels of court, uh, clerked them, and filed them, need to cooperate better. They need to work more. Um, uh, they need to orchestrate their <coughs> schedules and their. <laughs> so they can do the same thing in less space. Is it going to work? I don't really have a clue. I don't have a clue. But clearly, Judge Arnold thinks uh, the whole idea was not good. Um, the state had meetings with the judges to get their input. Um, Judge Arnold said a couple of things. And they said, well, we've really already decided. And he said, well, it's, you don't need me any left. And that, that's a perfectly legitimate thing for him to have done. They had made up their mind about what the specs were, what the design was going to be. For my money, they went through the motions of, you know, getting input from the judges, but it wasn't about to change anything. Uh, we did, we, the county, did have some meetings with them because the sheriff was concerned about some of the security aspects and the logic of some of the design work. We managed to uh, have some changes made in response to that, uh, but that building will be inefficient in some measure. It's going to take more <coughs> bailiffs just because of the way in which the uh, rooms are spread out and uh, where the bad guys are going to be and uh, who's got to be with them and transporting them up and down. So it's going to be a little more labor intensive. Um, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, the feeling was this, this will be the, our only opportunity to get a new court, however bad it might be. There's not going to be another opportunity from the new market tax credit, from the state budget area, from the local budget scene. You know, is this perfect? Absolutely not. But would we ever, in the next 20 or 30 years, have an opportunity that would present itself like this to at least try to get a new court held? Uh, the feeling is no. And so this was the best game in town. I think, uh, I think, Jan. Yeah, did you have a question? I was just going to switch it to the jail. Let's keep okay. on, on the court. Right. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. One, one is, is the uh, county looking at changing its pension plans to its employees? Private sector has moved away from pension plans totally. Um, they're going to the 401ks, and there's a, a joint effort between the company and the employee who are providing support for the retirement. And I, I don't know if the public sector has embraced the changes that the private sector have been forced through cost-saving measures to, to take on. And my second question is, um, is there an effort between the schools, the city, and the county to take a look at the entire tax bill and kind of forecast out with all of the uh, programs that each have underway today to try to determine where they see the tax bills settling out four or five years from now? Uh, 
Um, the th answer to the first question is uh, no. The second the answer to the second question is yes. How bad does it look? Um, well, with respect to the pension, um, we don't have any control of the structure or administration of the New Hampshire retirement system. The retirement system statutes simply require that uh, any county employee who works so many hours contributes to the New Hampshire state retirement system. Those are things that are governed and uh, designed and conquered. We simply contribute. Our employees retire under the plan that is has been continued to be managed up in Concord. Um, so if the state legislators, the Senate and governor, decide to change the retirement system, that's where that change would take place. Um, I think there have been some discussions <coughs> about it. Um, and so I think prospectively, I think uh, you can probably anticipate that the era uh, of a defined benefit of pension will fade and uh, will move more towards the chancier uh, structures that, that we're, we're moving towards. Um, obviously, the reluctance is uh, how you change the rules and when you change the rules. When in private business, it's easier to, I'll say, shaft the employee of dedicated dozens of years and then leave them hanging at the worst possible time in the life. still have a job, that's what you have to look at it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, in the public uh, sector, uh, there's a little reluctance to uh, do that. Uh, but I do think it would be responsible, at least prospectively, to change the expectations of what it means to have dedicated 10 or 20 years to public service what you can expect for that retirement. But I, I, I would certainly hope it would be prospective, not an ambush, uh, when you're turning 60 or 62 and have no way to look back and do things differently. Um, the second question was, uh, we, we meet uh, and talk, uh, not so much with the schools, but uh, we, we have a meeting with the city and talk about some of the capital projects and we're at least a little bit aware and we try to share that sort of thing. The difficulty is, um, it's very difficult to plan a schedule for capital improvements uh, with any reliability. The new jail would be a good example. We could have sat down 10 or 12 years ago and said, hey, we're going to build a new jail. Uh, and then, of course, it didn't happen. We got side railed and then the price doubled over the decade. And, um, uh, but we do try to have a discussion be aware of, but we, it's virtually impossible to uh, coordinate what 30 elected officials do at the county level and, and what the city council does and what the school board people do. The timing uh, of all of those budget decisions rarely line up. The processes rarely cooperate with each other. The feedback and the issues, it's, it's very tough to coordinate, but we, we do try to at least be aware of it. And we have, have had discussions about about what the overlay might be if this happened and this happened. What are we doing? Is there another question? Tom? I was just going to ask about the jail. There was an article in the paper about um, federal um, prisoners. Mm -hmm. The ability for us to house 20 of them, et cetera. Without them, does, does the jail meet its budget objectives? Is that, is that a requirement of the budget balancing? Or well, it's not a requirement because it's a, it, it, whether or not we get federal inmates and how many is really kind of out of our control. Um, but do we plan for it? <coughs> is that in the budget? Oh, it's in the budget, yeah. yeah. It's one of those, um, it's one of those um, I won't say it's funny numbers, but at some point, in order to make the budget palatable, we had to increase the number of federal inmates substantially to the point where I, I don't know, Jane, are you on the executive committee? Yes. Yeah. What did I say? I said, you know, at some point people are going to be making stuff. Yes. I think because you did it, say it, that. You know, and I think I sat there quietly and thought, that's for sure. Yeah. And yeah, Rick so Van Wickler will be on Danny Mitchell's show at 9 o'clock this morning, I heard, right. talking about this very subject. So 
We yeah. don't have to get it's really, our phones. It's and really call. popular to think that we're going to get enough people in to cover the expense of this uh, and the other thing. And, uh, and of course, there was a feeding frenzy over the number of federal inmates we might get, and how much money, and how great that would be. Uh, we we have uh, increased substantially <coughs> the number of federal and in federal inmates that we have, um, and that's a good thing. You know, I'm expecting that um, you know we could approach um, somewhere between seven hundred thousand and a million dollars of rent. <coughs> So, but we'll see, you know, we, the only thing we can do is make contact with the various agencies, uh, tell them we have a transport vehicle and a transport team and we have the ability to get them, which is a requirement, um, and that we're open for business. Um, i say in the last uh, 40 days, I think we've doubled the number of federal inmates. So, we're making some progress. It'll always be around the line. We've been taking federal inmates for decades, I think, since the 50s. Uh, we've had an arrangement. With the numbers have been up and down. A lot of times the delegation uh, before Jane's time uh, said, we don't want those federal inmates. We only want to keep our own people. Well, you know, then as they realized, gee, it's 105 dollars a day, huh? Hmm. And we don't need as many of our local people as we think. <laughs> so, so politically, you know, there's some give and take, you know. The more money we see, the more likely we are to take. Uh, they're relatively low maintenance prisoners. Uh, they have a lot more at stake for misbehaving uh, than some of the, uh, I'll say the locals, but uh, we, we've never really had a problem. We still maintain control of them. If they're be particularly uh, difficult, uh, all we do is make a phone call and uh, say, move them out. And then they go somewhere else and be somebody else's problem. What, what do you think it, well, can you tell us, what is the cost to our society for moving these people around? And, and if we get a federal prisoner who is sent here from Utah, how does he get here and who pays for it? And well, the federal government pays all the transportation costs. Yeah. So they're paying us um, a mileage fee plus a personnel fee for two people to ride the vehicle. And what was the first? Well, I I'm not sure I understood they, the first they, part. They're probably that. flown from afar to, <coughs> you have to drive like to Manchester or Boston or Hartford? Um, well, clearly the government uh, flies prisoners around all the time when they need to yeah. move them. Uh, they also bus them around the country. There are a couple of bus routes, private bus routes that go around, picking up bad people and dropping them off. Uh, it's a long, boring ride. Uh, a good company. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe not. Could be, could be pretty, could be pretty comfortable. Uh, but the federal government pays all the costs associated with those prisoners. If one of those prisoners gets a headache, has to go to the hospital, the federal government is paying. They're paying uh, the medical bill and they're paying for one or two of our people to be at the hospital 24-7 to watch them. But we're not incurring any expenses related to the federal inmates. Well, through. <coughs> Jack, another real estate question. What happens to the uh, fabled uh, farm and uh, the old jail complex? Is there um, any prospect of selling those things? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, right now at the farm, uh, you might be seeing in a local newspaper an ad advertising uh, our newest venture into the sale of fresh raw local milk and fresh ground beef uh, and um, tenderloins, good tenderloins. Uh, we, uh, in the past, we, we, we produce four or five hundred thousand pounds of milk a year. Uh, we typically sell it and it winds up and you buy it at Gorilla or Fluid or somebody gets blended in with most of the other dairy farms. Uh, but we've started bottling it ourselves and selling it uh, fresh uh, raw milk. Yeah. So uh, you got to try some of that. That's pretty good. And we used to, we have 85 cows up there, about 60 or so, which are actively milking. 
if they get too old, uh, we slaughter them. Um, we used to just uh, pay to have the cow taken away. Uh, now we pay to have it slaughtered. We bring the meat back and we sell it. It gets about 1,900 pounds of beef uh, out of each cow. And so we're selling a, a hamburger, hamburger patties, tenderloins. So that's a venture to try to increase the income base of the farm and make it more sustainable. We'll also be doing some more timbering. We have a number of projects. Uh, we got a SHARE grant, S-A-R-E, has something to do with sustainability and agriculture. And um, that's through the uh, Conservation Commission. Um, trying to study what, how it is that the farm and its activities and its resources might dovetail with other community needs of a similar type to see if there's any connection or assistance or uh, foundation that can be offered. It's also looking at what could uh, happen to the old jail, but how it is that the jail structure might be able to be reused. Have a, a builder out there to look at it in, in collaboration with these uh, people. Uh, to see what sort of changes to the building could be reasonably made that would open the jail to a different use. I also, last weekend, entertained 19 Antioch students out at the farm uh, who also have a challenge of coming up with a sustainable plan for the farm and the jail and those resources out there. So we have a bunch of people looking at what, it, what should we do with this what, what, what should we do with these resources? What's, I'll say, the highest and best use that could benefit the community um, and move in the direction of not having any of those operations subsidized by the tax payer. So that's the direction we're moving in. It might involve a change of ownership. One of the things that gets in the way of, of, of managing that land out there, we have about 650 acres, <coughs> is that the government owns it. So because we own it, we can't get a lot of grants uh, that other farms can get. Because the government owns it, we can't even sell conservation easements. There's a conservation appraisal that we did that if the ownership of the property were in different hands, we could conceivably sell about $900,000 worth of conservation easements. One of the goals was to do that with the Manetnock Conservancy, establish an endowment whose interest would subsidize the operation of the farm, and that would get it off the tax rolls. Um, the conservancy wasn't successful at selling those easements, because the thought was, hey, you guys have owned it for the last 200 years. It is not at risk of development. So it just didn't seem to work very well. But we're continuing to look at what our options are to have a sustainable plan that moves in the direction of not requiring a subsidization from the property tax. How does it work with, with, with staffing do you, do you, since the jail? Do you still use prisoners out there at the, at the farm? And no. <coughs> we added one position at the farm to make up the difference for the eight or ten inmates that would work out there. We added, I think, three or four uh, people to the kitchen at Maplewood to make up for the eight or ten inmates to work out there. The inmates who used to be working at the nursing home in Westland and at the farm are now working at the new gym because they have their own kitchen, they have their own laundry, they have their own grounds. So those those inmates now work internally. It used to be, as you may know, that Maplewood produced all the food for the inmates. Maplewood did all the laundry for the inmates. And now they have those operations. Those are staffed by inmates with a minimum of pay staff. Follow-up thing. <coughs> then, uh, tell us why did we start a farm to begin with you know, 200 yep. years ago, and why are we still running it now? The uh, first question is easier to answer than the second. <laughs> uh, we started the farm because the farm was, I'll say, essential in minimizing the impact on the taxpayer. Remember, we sent those people out there because. In large measure, they were drunks and paupers and indigents and homeless and orphans. And we sent them way out there. We didn't really want to have to be burdened terribly by them. So they would grow their own food. 
they would cut their own uh, timber. We had a wood shop out there. We actually made uh, the boxes in which the produce went. We made furniture out there. There's a, there's a, a, a wood uh, equipment still out there. We saws that that whole deal. So the intention was that the county farm be as self-sufficient as possible. And if you look back at county reports from the mid 1800s, the superintendent back then was proud that the level of subsidization required by the taxpayers was something like five cents a year, um, and that everything else came out of the out of the farm. And they essentially tried to live off the farm. We grew tobacco out there as a cash crop uh, about uh, 140 years ago. Why we're in the business today is the perennial question. It has been a question that uh, many elected officials have been asking for decades. Uh, it's a working dairy farm, the whole issue of locally grown food, the whole sensitivity to farmland being converted to who knows what um, is um, what I think keeps the farm going. Uh, we don't need it for any aspect of county government. Um, that's the question, you know, what, if we didn't have it and if we didn't do it, what would be the responsible thing to do with the land? That's part of the question that we're asking the Antioch students and the Conservation Commission uh, to answer, to help us try to find, a, if we want, if we need an exit strategy, it has to be responsible, because we've got 650 acres, everybody, everybody, particularly the elected officials, I say everybody, but a lot of the public, because they, they did have some some public hearings on it. They want it to stay kind of sort of as it is. So we both want it, we don't. And that's about the way it's been for decades. You know, we, we, we can't muster the courage to just close the damn thing. Um, we can't muster the courage to actually make a lot of investment in it to make it more diversified. Um, so it's, a, it's a, just a chronic political question. Yeah. Why not lease it to a private sector person? Well, that was a, uh, we're, we haven't ruled that out. The, uh, some of the concerns are, what is it that we lease? Do we lease the equipment? Are we just leasing the land? Are we leasing the cows? If we're going to lease it, are we going to require that they do or not do certain things with the land in terms of what they apply? Um, and a lot of times the leasing of land for farm purposes doesn't generate a lot of money because uh, most dairy farms are losing money as it is. So it's not like there's a lot of cash for them to give us fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to lease it. I mean we, we have a fifteen thousand dollar property bill for the farm, so arguably you'd have to at least get that covered. Um, we've got um, probably um, three or four hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment out there if you want to lease that and you could sell it but now the new person's got to figure out <coughs> if they have enough equipment to do it um, so it's not quite as simple as that because a there's not a market for it at least as we've determined yeah but we're not done uh, and then we have to scope out what the terms of that lease would be but it is absolutely still on the table. Well, Jack, I was interested in your comment earlier about the threat to drinking water by the amount of meds being flushed. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that institutional <coughs> uh, organizations are not doing that. I mean, if you, I would assume the county farm, uh, the, uh, the nursing home is not flushing meds, that there'd be another way. I'm assuming Cheshire Medical isn't. So who's doing, these are all just folks in their, in their home dumping a lot of meds down? Well, you know the problem with assumptions, Paul. <laughs> as a matter of fact, federal I've law. Been there a lot, yeah. <laughs> as a matter of fact, one of the schizophrenic aspects of government is that at the moment, although there are rules, um, uh, there's a rule change pending now at the federal level. Federal regulation now requires, requires that drugs in a nursing home <coughs> be flushed down the toilet by a pharmacist. 
<laughs> so there's one side of the government saying you got to do this. The environmental people are saying, oh, for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. um, so it is exactly part of the schizophrenia of regulation that has caused this discussion about uh, pharmaceutical product, uh, products in the wastewater and in drinking water. And that's why there's so much activity. It's going to take a couple years <coughs> um, for that to all iron out. But, um, and there's, there's a lot of legitimate and uh, well, well intentioned discussion on it, all of us that recognize that uh, many of the laws that regulate pharmaceutical products are outdated uh, and simply are wrong for where we're at today with the number of pharmaceutical products and over the counter drugs um, that are being consumed. But <coughs> aside from that, it is homes. For decades, we've been telling people to flush it keep your children safe, and now they just get to drink it later. When you have your, your drug collection, <coughs> what do you do with them? Uh, the proper method uh, for that is to incinerate them. They go to a certified uh, incinerator, which is licensed to incinerate medical or hazardous waste, which means it gets incinerated and there's scrubbers and uh, there's, so there's control over where the ashes go and what the emissions are and that sort of thing. And there's a couple of places um, that do that um, in the state. There's, there's at least one, uh, maybe two. So incineration is the preferred route that people are going to now. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Jack, you mentioned a study was done about renovating the existing nursing home versus my recollection was that a renovation, uh, which really is just mostly paint, paper, and some infrastructure, but not a lot of structural stuff, was somewhere between two and four million dollars. Is that is that being contemplated? Is that being done, or is it on hold until it's on other hold. decisions? It's on hold until we have the larger discussion about what the future is, uh, not only for Maplewood and Westmont, but what the county's role in long-term care ought to be. If there was a if there was a decision that we simply uh, lease that building out, turn that operation over, get out of the business altogether, or empty it over time through attrition, uh, then there would be no reason to be spending four million dollars on paint and paper. So those are all part of the discussion that over the next uh, couple few years will take place so that there can be a reasonable, defensible, organized, logical approach to whatever we do. But, but given that the reality of the jail is a 10-year discussion, look, <coughs> uh, investigation, um, if there's roof problems or things, you know, those kinds of issues, wouldn't, wouldn't it be worthwhile to invest that money to protect the facility for the period of time that it might take to make that decision, it might vote be. on it and build it out? It might. Yeah. It might. Yeah. It might. Yeah. I mean, it's not like we're not repairing these things. I mean, we have a painter in the house that, you know, tries to get with it. We have an electrician and we have a plumber. You know, their day is spent, you know, going around patching these things together and it's not like no, uh, no, uh, that's, that's, not, that's not happening internally to some extent. But we just started, we just uh, within the last year hired a technical firm to come in uh, with some engineers and kind of assess the building and present some options. We've just barely started the discussion with the delegation about the plan to make the assessment and reach some sort of reason to conclude. So we're at the very early end of that. And just lastly, because we here we get tied in going to all the meetings that I go to and the discussions that I'm in. Make a note of that. Um, Tom gets high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's only a hope. Yeah, I know. But, but people, I guess there's a, there's a great concern because the economy is what it is. The businesses are treading water, keeping a natural life, you know, keeping alive until something flips. There's high unemployment. Um, and some of the spending that's going on, 
people are very, very concerned with because they don't have the wherewithal to support it. And we continually incur debt. Is the county feeling that reaction from people or the pressure? I mean, the county for years performed a role that was somewhat under the radar screen. You know, it wasn't, wasn't costing people a lot of money. And, and then with the jail, it kind of pumped it right up to the people. Oh, my God, you know, all this investment, et cetera. And now with the, the, the potential for the nursing home being out there, are you feeling or are, or are the uh, county administrators feeling the pressure from the population to, to not do some of these things, not do some of this spending? I mean, I mean, I hear it all the time. You know, why, why is it okay for them to just keep burdening us with stuff? And, and I'm not saying you. I'm just saying them government. You know, uh, whether it be on the state, local, federal level, it all comes downhill. And when people don't have jobs or, or, or they have limited incomes, their ability to support those things, not that they're unnecessary, you know, um, some people don't think they're necessary, some people think they're nice. You know, uh, so we have that debate. I mean, do you feel that pressure? As not you personally, but, but the county, feel that pressure more than ever? Well, Jane might have a different answer for this as a member of the House than I, than I do. We don't, uh, we hear some of them, but not a lot, frankly. I mean, first of all, you know, the areas in, in which the county makes capital <coughs> expenditures is relatively narrow. It's not anywhere near as broad as the infrastructure that, say, the city has municipalities in terms of roads and this and that and the other thing. Um, so it's pretty limited. Most of ours have a long lead time, so people see them coming, understand them, and generally have been supportive. You know, there really wasn't a lot of disagreement that the jail needed to be replaced. Um, it took a little longer, and unfortunately the price doubled. <coughs> My plan when we started looking at this was, by the time we had to start talking about the nursing home, had the jail been constructed for 18 million rather than 38 million, and had it happened eight years sooner, been completed eight years sooner, we'd have been over the bump of the principal and interest cost, so that the next project could line up, and there wouldn't be a dramatic spike in the tax uh, property tax bill. Uh, as it is, because the jail took so long to get going, that's kind of crunched it into the nursing home capital project. Um, for better or for worse, you know, the infrastructure of the county is all about the same age, because we went through this back in the 70s. Um, so it's all aging out at the same time. So the, my thought was to try to coordinate so that the, the, the bell curve of, of principal and interest payment it wouldn't go up like this. It would go up once, come down, and then be much more gentle as we phase through the next infrastructure wave through government buildings. I, that's still my goal. Uh, and I think that means that the nursing home is going to get pushed off so longer. Uh, but again, it depends upon where the dialogue goes. To what extent, if at all, we're going to be in the business. We're going to be in the business for short run. And the, and the exit plan is longer than maybe two or four million dollars to tweak the building for another decade makes sense. We're in it for the long haul, and the people are getting sicker, and they need more resources. It might make sense to move it closer to the resources and team. You know, it's just not clear yet. But we do think about that. But I don't get a lot of calls. We don't get a lot of people showing up at the commissioner's meetings. Every once in a while, there may be somebody that says that damn county budget. Um, but they've come to our budget meetings and they realize, you know, we don't, we do this, we've been doing the same thing, spending the same money for a long time. All of the increases are not, uh, uh, I'll say they're not particularly controllable, they're retirement, they're the normal things that keep the employees uh, employed in the community, and, uh, cost of living and insurance, uh, health insurance, uh, uh, and there's not a lot of place to take money from, them, you know, unless we're going to, we're going to, if we cut employees, then we're either we're going to have to cut them into nursing, or we're going to have to cut them in the sheriff's office. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of uh, of um, discretionary employees. I mean, we've made changes and reduced some staffing and finance. We've cut some clerical positions back. We eliminated um, a 
two positions in the registry of deeds. Uh, but there's not a lot of areas for those. The work that the sheriff's office does is increasing. The work that the jail does is increasing. The work that the nursing home does is increasing. Those are what county government does. And, uh, so, but I don't see I don't see we take a lot of heat. I don't know if Jane gets a lot of calls at home. No, I don't get a lot of calls at home. I would like to get more calls at home. And what Tom was saying is, are people complaining or are people happy? You really never know. And what I would like to remind the people of here in this meeting and out in our greater community and even in the broadest sense, the government in our country, who is the government? The government is the people. And people tend to sit back and say, what's the government doing for me or what are they not doing for me, but they don't really get out and get into it. And we have two other candidates here that I'm aware of, and three. Sam Hawks is running for the legislature in Keene, and um, Dennis Murphy from Winchester, and Sharon Castor is running for a position in the probate. It's Susan. What, pardon? Susan, Susan Castor, right, is running for uh, what's your office called? Probate. 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 Right. And I'm running again for my third term in the legislature. And I would tell them that the most frustrating thing for me is to work so hard and be at all the meetings that are required of me in the legislature and in the county position and not have people come directly by phone or letter or in person and speak up and say, what do you think we should do? Because it's your, it, you are the government. You are here to take care of that and, and make it go the way you want it to. Well <laughs> Feel better. Thank you. Also running for re-election. Also running for re-election. Yes, and Sheriff Foot. Yes, I forget. Please, no campaigning within 300 feet of the road. What's that name? What we can say? Interestingly, every state in the union is wrestling with these same budget problems, and there are many states that have local taxes, state taxes, income taxes, property taxes. They have taxes at every point you turn around. They have the same issues. They're simply uh, having difficulty raising the funds that they need to do what it is they're doing. Uh, I don't know of any state that's not affected by that. Well, there is. Alaska has a surplus. Of <laughs> <laughs> any other questions for Jack? Thank you so very much, Jack. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank Friendly Commons for uh, allowing us to use your facility. I uh, hope the information that you got today was interesting and meaningful to you. And again, thanks for coming, and we'll announce the next one uh, as we set it up. Again, thanks so much for coming. Uh, have a great day.